works. You ready now? Okay, we'll go back to bring you the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mayor and, uh, and Council Members, you've been. I, I will say that we're, we're not going to do the on the agenda. We're not going to do the executive session right now. We, we may do it a little later because we're behind schedule, so we're going to do it a little later. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, your discussion uh, this so far this morning focused on new neighborhood choices. Um, on the whiteboard here, we've we've written our notes of what we understand of the direction that you've provided so far um, in terms of new neighborhood choices, and particularly those questions about how do we want to handle providing services and paying for the cost of those services um, going forward. So let me recap what we've written here and see if we heard you correctly. Uh, so number one, uh, the contracts for services with outside entities must cover the full costs of those services. That was uh, the first point. Um, and so underneath that is the, the need to renegotiate to cover those costs uh, for the police and fire services in, in Well, but to that, I would add not just police and fire services, but any services provided to outside Okay. Okay. And any other services provided outside That way it covers that list. Well, and, and the second point that we've got down here is talking about uh, those requests for new services. Um, and that would be whether that's coming from the folks in Castle Hills or if, if someone else was uh, making those requests. Um, and so the, that last long list that you had, uh, in terms of those additional services, the direction that I think we heard, or at least I heard, uh, that we wouldn't be providing those unless the city has some legal authorization or ability to provide them. That seems pretty straightforward. Uh, secondly, that in doing those, we would be pricing that to cover the full cost of the service plus that additional administrative or contingency cost um, as well. So that, that would be the way that those would be calculated or, or factored. Um, and thirdly, if there are any kinds of facilities that those would be on land that the city owns. Did we hear those points correctly? On the facilities, I say it's other than a facility that they want to build that they want to. Build. It's city owned, it needs to be on city property. I think that's what you do. That's, yeah, so let's clarify that. Okay, so did we hear those correctly? Okay. And then, um, in just to wrap up on those new neighborhood choices, uh, we the presentations that you've heard are clear that there is um, a lot of new population that will be coming to Eastern Louisville. Uh, are there any other issues or any further direction you'd like to provide the staff as they think about preparing the budget for next year in terms of services uh, to, to support the growth in, in Louisville on that, that new east side population growth? Is this covered? Are there, is there any other direction from the standpoint of uh, a budget that you want to give the staff at this time? Feel comfortable with that? All right, great. It's time to turn our team on to sustainability. Into the next one of the big news that we'll talk about this morning. Um, and I am going to give you just a really quick um, overview on a couple of issues. Um, after the meeting wrapped up last night, TJ was talking about wanting to be data driven when we heard from uh, the, the video that we saw at the end of the day about looking at numbers. And so I'm going to just share a little bit of, uh, of that background in terms of sustainability, what other cities are seeing in terms of both public and private uh, construction. Um, and then after that brief intro, uh, Lisa, Todd, and Cleve are going to provide you with information about particular programs. And the kind of direction that we'll be looking to get from you on, uh, on all of these is uh, your sense of what are the priorities for focus during this current, during 15, and as we put together the budgets for 15, 16. So we'll be looking for that direction on this topic. So uh, the, the list that you see on the screen here is the uh, set of the, the key items under the big move for sustainability, and I know you're familiar with that. Um, one of those, uh, um, some of the reasons for that uh, is really part of that brand or that community character and identity that you've established through Louisville 2025. Uh, but I think the, the statistics, the information shows that uh, these things are ones that make sense for this community as well as, as global sustainability. Um, research by a, an organization that's called Architecture 2030 is identifying that buildings are consuming about half of the energy uh, produced in the world, uh, responsible for 44% of carbon generation, and, and here's the opportunity part of it and the part that we want you to be focusing on and thinking about, 
By the year 25, they estimate that about 75% of the building stock in the U.S. will either be <coughs> new buildings or will be buildings that have been modified since 2010. So as you think about that and you think about your community, those areas that are yet to be developed and the areas where you're talking about renovation, reuse, revitalization, in all of those places, the choices, the kinds of standards, the kinds of incentives that are in place today can make a big difference in terms of the long-term sustainability of this community from the standpoint of its, of its building stock. So a couple of other things, I, I think that there's often a perception that this is something that's just for, uh, just to feel good or it's just uh, something that's in, of interest to a small fringe group of people. But what we're seeing these days is not that, that it's really changed a lot. So a couple of uh, key little snapshots. Uh, the National Association of Realtors has identified that home buyers are willing to pay more for homes that are energy efficient or certified in some way. So the realtors are saying, this is what they see in the marketplace today. Trees save a lot. They're not just, uh, just because they look pretty, uh, but they can reduce air conditioning needs by 30%, save 20 to 50% on uh, energy use and heating. There's a study done looking at the, the tree cover in Houston. To me, Houston is not a city that I think of as having a lot of trees particularly, uh, but the, the research said that it removes over 60,000 tons of air pollution annually. So that urban forest in Houston, which again is not a particularly intense urban forest, I don't think, um, is making an impact in terms of the public health and air quality. Uh, in 2014, the LEED certified space, which is that one particular version of a certification, accounts for about a fifth of the total commercial floor area in the major U.S. markets. That includes our Dallas-Fort Worth region. So increasingly what's happening is this is part of the market for real estate. And what I hear from folks in that development business in terms of things like office buildings is the tenants are expecting to have that. And so if you build a building that doesn't meet those standards, you're basically going to be falling behind in, in your interest of being competitive. So it's changed quite a lot in the last several years in terms of how that goes. One example here is a, a building in Boise, Idaho. Again, not a place that I would particularly associate with um, a lot of green initiatives. Uh, but the developer of this building, Gary Christensen, uh, opened it in 2006. It's designed at a LEED Platinum level, which is the highest level for the, the LEED certifications. And the results, he came and, and made a presentation to uh, the North Texas Urban Land Institute, which is a group of developers uh, and designers and that association of professionals in that business. And the results that he shared, this is after the building had been um, operating for about seven years, 50% uh, less energy use, 65% less potable water, 80% less water for sewage conveyance. So thinking about that issue we talked last night on uh, water consumption, 32% uh, return on his investment as a business person. One of the developers in the Dallas area asked him what would he have done differently uh, now that he's got the track record and experience. He said, I would do more. So it's a big change from what people were experiencing a few years ago. Uh, a lot of statistics, I'm not going to go through all of these individual quotes here, but more and more people like the U.S. military, who's focused a lot on, uh, on building efficiency, uh, they're saying it doesn't cost less uh, to do green design. And one of the caveats of that, if you can go on to the next slide, uh, is it doesn't necessarily cost less if you think about it from the beginning of the design process. And so um, as we think about uh, new buildings, whether that's new public buildings, new city facilities, or as you think about standards for design and development of new buildings that would be built in the private sector, including the green design aspects at the beginning of the process, rather than packing them on at the end, uh, the, the research and the experience today is showing uh, that you can do the, you can accomplish those savings without a significant uh, increase in cost, not as high as what you think. The, the World Green Building Council uh, did some research on actual projects and how much more it costs to, be, to go green, looking at comparisons with conventional buildings. They found that the actual cost was either a savings of 0.4% up to 12.5% for a completely zero carbon emission building. So that's the kind of range of current experience on uh, additional cost to design with, with that green concept, uh, whereas people often perceive it to be up to about a 30% cost premium uh, to build green. And that's 
changing that. That might have been the case five, ten years ago, but the research today is saying that uh, it's not particularly if you build those things in from the start. So as you think about uh, the capital projects we'll talk about tomorrow, and you think about uh, the kind of new buildings, Leroy, last night you were mentioning the notion of uh, building buildings differently in, in Louisville for the future. Uh, so design standards and things of that kind, uh, really this ties in with your sustainability initiatives and really helps to save energy, save costs, and, and fits with the character that, that you've identified. So I wanted to share a few of those things at the, at the, at the beginning here, uh, see if there's some questions or discussion. This is the, the sort of bigger picture aspect. Then, as I said, we'll move into some very specific items that are underway now for which we want your further direction. Questions on that? Does that make sense to folks? Is that what you ex would expect? <coughs> You know, if I had a question for the council, it'd be at what point do we take that step and say this is what we're doing? We're doing uh, our new construction will be LEED certified to some level. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that question, and I, I will note that that question and uh, come back to it because part of what you'll hear from Cleve is about the green code and the status of that green code, and that in a way is taking a step that looks at all. LEED is one of several kinds of certifications. And so let's uh, hear from Cleve about what, his, uh, what the status of the Green Code is, because that will tie into that as well. As, as well as from U and T, they'll be part of their analysis also. Yeah, yeah there's, there's for, the, for the city buildings, for sure. Okay. Well, what I was looking at was in future construction. For private city? City. 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 Okay. And, and that's, okay. Exactly that's exactly what you're going to hear about that with, with Okay. okay. So with that, Lisa, let me ask you to come up and, and talk. Okay. Um, what we've done, uh, the first action item on our <coughs> sustainability move is, of course, the uh, sustainability audit. And as Donna mentioned to you yesterday, we were very pleased that we were able to extend our current partnership with UNT, where we're working on the Green Centerpiece and incorporate this audit into their into the sustainability program that they have there at UNT. Um, that doesn't just enhance that partnership, but they do bring a lot of credentials to the table. UNT's sustainability program was created in 2009, but they are not only nationally, but they're internationally uh, acclaimed for that program. If you've been on the campus uh, any time lately, it, it oozes with sustainability, <laughs> largely uh, due to the staff efforts there. Uh, we're excited that they have the expertise, uh, not just in the sustainability office, but literally hundreds of uh, resources through multiple disciplines uh, in the academic environment and researchers. Uh, engineering, uh, biology, uh, it's, it's so extensive. Uh, all of those uh, resources are brought to the table as they're doing the sustainability study for us. What we asked Todd to do, we started this in February, so we've only had just a few weeks for them to actually start the data collection, and we're still in that data collection stage. So we asked Todd to uh, focus on three areas. Uh, I think 2025 had some broad areas. We narrowed those down to those six there. Uh, the built environment, city fleet, energy, landscaping, water, and solid waste management. Uh, and we asked him to focus on the things that we saw as, as high users. Uh, so we looked at the treatment plants, we looked at our city fleet, and then we looked at our landscaping practices in the parks and the green spaces. And he is going to approach this by just giving you an overview of what their method was. And then uh, he'll talk to you a little bit about the things that bubbled to the top uh, uh, that are good things that we're doing, things we can be proud of. And then uh, he'll identify some potential areas for improvement and uh, some preliminary, very preliminary recommendations uh, that we can talk about probably more in uh, depth in a moment. So uh, we have Dr. Todd Spinks, who's the director of UNT Sustainability, and his staff that's working very closely <coughs> with us, Brandon Zitter and Will McCary, uh, that are also doing data collection for us. So Todd, we'll let you go. Okay. 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 Ok
And is this good or? Uh, you yes, might want to come up yeah. and just put your slides on the other yeah, so that they can be looking at the slides and letting <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. When did you get you in the suit? Well, good morning to, to everyone. And I have to thank Lisa first and foremost for um, giving me a new term to go back to my marketing director that we are oozing at UNC. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm sure she'll be proud that I come back with a report. Uh, today, I, I want to offer um, some commentary, uh, uh, some, some wording uh, on, on, in terms of our, our assessment. Um, but first, please allow me to, to convey uh, appreciation from the University of North Texas, uh, the UNT Sustainable Communities Initiative Team, which is housed in our UNT Sustainability Office, uh, and myself for your time today, um, and for the opportunity to work with your city and for your residents. Importantly, the SCI team as a component of UNT sustainability, brings a powerful approach uh, to understanding issues and developing sustainable solutions. Indeed, our objective is to go beyond the utility of sustainability as a catchphrase. Uh, and I'm a sustainability guy. I have a certain quote I have to say a certain number of times every day. But we really are, are moving beyond that with, with this type of an assessment. Uh, we, we want it to be more than just a, a mindset. Uh, we want to employ uh, sustainability in an effort like this as a problem-solving method. Beyond a traditional consulting type of relationship, the partnership with UNT and UNT SCI provides an opportunity to link complex challenges uh, confronting your city with the greatest intellectual asset in this part of the state, and indeed in this part of the country. In partnership with the City of Louisville, the University of North Texas is currently conducting this resource and efficiency assessment. And as Lisa mentioned, we have a, uh, access to over 300 uh, scholars uh, and researchers, experts at the university that engage in the sustainability sciences. And we can tap into them at any time to, to delve into some of your issues or, or, or uh, challenges. This assessment will provide a clear and accurate understanding of the interrelated economic and environmental impacts of the city's operations. We will also identify and analyze key performance indicators that are linked to efficient management uh, of a community's limited resources. It is a tool to support strategic and sustainable development. The assessment will provide recommendations to strengthen the city's operational assets, providing support for its future efforts to enhance the community's character, its culture, its environmental condition, and economic growth. The assessment began in, 20, uh, in February 2015 and we are still in the data collection phase, as Lisa mentioned. The assessment will support the vision and goals of Louisville 2025's big ideas, diversity, growth, connection, and resource management. The assessment also considers the linkages to and between Louisville's 2025's big moves, with particular emphasis on the green centerpiece, extending the green, thriving neighborhoods, and of course sustainability. Most importantly, the resource and efficiency assessment fulfills the first action of the sustainability big move, to conduct an audit of existing city sites, facilities, and vehicle fleet. Specific areas of focus are the city's built environment, the city fleet, energy management policies and practices, parks, green spaces, and landscaping, water management policies and practices, and public facility solid waste management and recycling programs. Uh, final recommendations are expected by May for this year. In the initial phase, the initial phase of this assessment focused on resources used by the treatment uh, plants, the city fleet, and city parks and green spaces. The next phase will consist of a full assessment of all the city-owned and built environment, energy management policies and practices, water management policies and practices, and the solid waste and recycling policies and practices. Several data collection methods have been undertaken to include site visits, staff <coughs> reviews, equipment specifications, annual reports, rate structures, budgets, maintenance schedules, and master plans. Including all of these methods, methods ensures we capture the organization, existing priorities, and the impacts of, of those priorities, policies, and practices on the city's resources. In terms of our preliminary <coughs> observations, first I'm going to uh, focus on or discuss uh, the water and wastewater treatment plants and their supporting sites. The focus in this area has been to increase the understanding of the wastewater and water treatment plants efficiency rates regarding energy and water use. In terms of the strengths in this area, the water and wastewater treatment plants and sites demonstrated a number of proactive efficiency measures, seemingly due to Louisville's responses to Texas State Energy Conservation Office requirements over the last decade regarding ener energy efficiency goals for political subdivisions in non-attainment areas. 
The plans, plans were found to have several strengths in areas of data collection and monitoring, as well as equipment efficiency. Data collection and monitoring. Many of the water treatment and wastewater treatment sites are sub-metered. This allows for greater understanding of which pieces of equipment <coughs> use the most energy, where cost savings are possible, and where other areas might be improved. As well, when equipment is replaced or repaired, it is easier to evaluate the specific increase in efficiency. For example, treatment plants track the daily amount of water that flows through the system to improve the understanding of equipment efficiency. Daily water flow information can also be used to gain a refined understanding of external variable effects such as weather, weather programs, and policies on water use, and why water is used by residents in terms of, of equipment efficiency. The lifespan of water treatment equipment generally ranges from 15 to 30 years. As a consequence, equipment is likely to be replaced with, a more, efficient, with more efficient equipment or retrofitted regularly. As well, because of the use of submeters, inefficient equipment or equipment that does not meet city standards can be easily identified and replaced. Additionally, the city is replacing older motors with variable frequency drive or VFD motors, allowing water to be moved even more efficiently. Finally, outdoor lighting is also being replaced with much more efficient LED bulbs and technology. In terms of the city fleet, the focus in this area has been to improve understanding of efficiency rates of the fleet regarding vehicle utility, fuel consumption, vehicle maintenance, vehicle replacement, and general environmental impact. Regarding its strengths, Vehicle efficiency. The city tracks its fleet vehicles by type, department, fuel type, and fuel consumption rate. Such an approach to vehicle management allows for enhanced identification of potential efficiency improvements. And this approach can also be used to identify possibilities for potential vehicle replacement where feasible with electric or hybrid vehicles or vehicles that have a higher mile per gallon uh, rate. The city currently has a no idling policy and the city's comprehensive inventory list of vehicles allows for regular budgeted vehicle replacement, ensuring vehicle MPG or mile per gallon efficiency, and the ability to understand overall fleet efficiency and environmental impact. Regarding the parks and green spaces, the focus in this area has been to increase understanding of efficiency rates of parks and green spaces regarding energy consumption, water use, maintenance, and general environmental impact. In terms of the strengths in this area, the city's existing 2011 open space vision plan is very holistic, very strategic, and very purposeful. The plan includes numerous recommendations, many of which have already been implemented, for improvements to park functionality to draw the community together and expand return on investment, park expansion to support additional neighborhoods and areas, and resident value on, park, on, on, and resident value on parks, green spaces, and environmental awareness. Increased resident activity in the parks, green spaces, and recreation centers will definitely lead to greater resident investment in this community, <coughs> healthier lifestyles, and an avenue to disseminate sustainability, education, and awareness. Parks and Leisure Services, or PAPS, follows a very conservative watering schedule. This results in reduced greenhouse gas emissions as well as reduced costs. As, as also important and positive is that PALS utilizes local access to the Trinity River for irrigation purposes of Toyota Park, and has strategically designed the park to direct stormwater runoff back into the river. PALS also follows a conservative maintenance schedule for parks and green spaces. This leads to reduced environmental impact and lower budget expenditures. In terms of our potential, of what we found in, uh, with, with potential improvements, again, I want to start with the water and wastewater treatment plants. A substantial portion of the city's utility budget is spent on water intake, water treatment processes. Equipment efficiency. A more complete and accurate understanding of the maximum efficiency capabilities of all equipment, particularly as efficiency is affected by weather and seasonal influences, should be researched. Informa information should then be used to develop a comprehensive strategy to maximize the equipment's potential. Complete mapping of all mechanical components and their relation to the water treatment processes should be undertaken to allow for greater accuracy in planning for future cost savings projects, including the nominal efficiencies for each component, will allow for a greater ability to identify where the most energy is being used, particularly as it relates to weather and or seasonal influences. Resulting cost savings and increased efficiency can support reinvestment in water and or wastewater treatment plant improvements. Water consumption and capture. 
water consumption by the city, by the city's infrastructure, and staff to be more fully researched to capture the interrelatedness of these two elements. Water conservation programming for the city should be enhanced, and programs to promote water capture, where feasible, should be created. Stormwater management plans should also be updated to identify potential water capture strategies and locations. This area will also likely demonstrate itself as a, as a prime candidate for enhanced benefits to the city in the form of on-site renewable energy generation, community garden activities and or programs, tree plantings to shade and cool structures, and stormwater management changes. Regarding the city fleet, first vehicle efficiency. A vehicle replacement strategy that considers foreseeable federal mile per gallon standards for vehicles and city replacement needs to determine the best that needs to, needs to determine the best timing of vehicle repla replacement could be developed. Where feasible, vehicles could be replaced with alternative fuel, hybrid, propane, or LPG, uh, conventional <coughs> hybrid, or electric vehicles to reduce cost and environmental impact without undermining a unit's mission. While replacing older vehicles with newer models can lead to increased fuel efficiency, older models should not necessarily be replaced with a newer version of the, of the same model. Fuel consumption. The upcoming implementation of a GPS tracking system should be tied to a travel logging management strategy for particular vehicles. Such a strategy will delineate the specific purpose of the GPS system and allow for the most accurate understanding of vehicle fuel efficiency, vehicle use, travel expenses, and environmental impact. Travel logging will also support the development of travel and vehicle use policies as well as route efficiency programs. In terms of baseline indicators and metrics, to maximize the utility and, efficient, and the efficiency of the fleet to provide services with a minimum environmental impact, baseline indicators and a holistic strategy to support Louisville 2025 should be established. Regarding the parks and green spaces, first the 2011 Open Space Vision Plan. Comprehensively bridging the 2011 Open Space Vision Plan to Louisville 2025, with utilizable information in GIS will provide powers and the city with a purposeful tool to strategically enhance places and services. GIS applications should include, but not be limited to, parks and green space location, a plant inventory, plant condition, and site functionality and usage. A tree inventory value assessment should be incorporated to understand the relationship between investments in the tree canopy and property value as well as its contribution to reduce the city's environmental impact. Fertilizer. PALS currently uses synthetic fertilizers. Research should be undertaken to develop a funding model to increase the use of organic fertilizers. Such a model can be created in consideration of other PALS initiatives to determine an accept acceptable return on investment. Such a measure will further demonstrate the city's commitment to environmental stewardship. A usage assessment. While usage information is available for recreation center memberships and organized team activity at certain facilities, a mechanism to capture a more accurate number of visitors to specific facilities will enhance the city's decision-making efforts to support Louisville 2025. Recycling. A cohesive city plan for recycling signals a commitment to sustainability principles, as well as establishes a fundamental activity that engages community members and helps grow immunability for more advanced sustainability-related measures to be implemented. Accordingly, the city should continue its efforts to establish a strategic and purposeful recycling program at its park and recreational facilities. Policies related to vendor services and support, as well as education, public awareness campaigns, should be linked to this program. Such a program will lead to reduce emissions and improve park and green space aesthetics. Renewable energy. The city should develop a comprehensive renewable energy strategy for the entire city to ensure the most cost-effective approach and to ensure an attempt is made to multiply the benefits of such technology integration way beyond cost savings. For example, solar power lighting could be installed as needed to reduce costs, to reduce emissions, and enhance educational activities within the ISD. Additional renewable energy technologies are potential options for the city's green spaces as elsewhere. So just to recap in terms of the more prominent preliminary recommendations. Uh, first we have create a holistic coordinated renewable energy plan. Implement targeted replacement of vehicles with higher MPG standards 
and alternate fuel, uh, fuel capabilities. Enhanced travel logging, uh, uh, travel logging strategy for all vehicle types and uses. Bridge the 2011 Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Vision Plan to Louisville 2025. Develop comprehensive user data metrics for the parks and recreation centers. And establish an enhanced recycling plan for public facilities and parks. So with that being said, I would like to open it up for any questions that you have. My first question is, when you first began, you said something about you had, what, 300 professors? <coughs> 300. Yes, sir. Well, you know, uh, Louisville's got, we're kind of a hub. We have Louisville, Coppell, Flower Mound, Island Village, Colony, uh, Carrollton, Farmer's Branch, probably the total population, four or 500,000 uh, people there. It seems to me like it would uh, make great sense for his green lives as far as North Texas to maybe move a facility down here to Louisville and ship those professors <laughs> down here so they can be in touch with that 500,000 population. And if they currently live with them, they can just ride the train and just think how much green that would be and cut down on emissions. So I think that would be something North Texas would really want to look at to be able to stay in touch with so it's not just the city of Louisville. I'm not serious. It's not just the city of Louisville that you're reaching. When you come down here and you, you put a Facility down there. Hey, put it in Lila. Yeah. It, how green is Lila? You know, and, and then you're touching all of those. See, you're touching probably close to 500,000 people in population in all the cities that manage it, and it's not as far removed. When you're on site like that, I think that you know, a picture's worth a thousand work. When you see it you visually, you go and visit it, it's, it's a much more meaningful part. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 couldn't, uh, I couldn't make a stronger argument for for a, a, a much stronger relationship you know, to have, a, a, I think, a more engaging presence. One of the reasons that the Sustainable Communities Initiative was actually created by UNT uh, a few years ago was that they wanted to change the dynamic of the way in which it's engaging communities. And even beyond sort of a, a satellite campus taking a piece of it and, and putting it into a city on a, sort of on a micro level and actually engaging the community day to day, week to week, year to year, uh, in a very holistic way, a very purposeful way, um, uh, to, to help bring our assets, our global network, to you to help you support your efforts to solve problems and, and, and decision making. So this is a great idea. I'll, I'll definitely take it back. Um, I, I know from my position uh, in, in reporting to the senior VP at, at the university that um, it is adamant about strengthening the relationship with Louisville. And, and I know you all are very aware of all the things that are happening. Um, and so I think the time is right to have these types of discussions. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not sure, but I think Lila would be a, a, a great spot. You've got land there. You've got land. Yeah. You know, you're you're going to talk about that, but it would have been interesting. When you, yeah, when you talk about the cost of the three facility, you know, right there, that just lowers your cost by 50%. Right? Yeah. 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 The land and stuff. And, and you've got all those resources right there with you. So that's definitely part of that nature center when we talk about that tomorrow, as well as just the overall master strategy that we shared with you briefly uh, for that whole that whole green center piece. Because you mentioned so, solar energy, uh -huh. that wind turbines, so the university energy turbines. What are we done with? With wind? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, we we do it because you know how we handle this. I do. In terms of installation or research or utilization yeah. is, is a means of generating power. Right. So we, we have uh, uh, actually uh, one of our, our energy engineers is working on his graduate degree there at uh, uh, in our, our energy engineering program. Uh, we have about 20 or 25 folks that do nothing but study renewable energy to include many, uh, the full game at geothermal, uh, to, uh, solar, 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 thermal, et cetera. Um, we have a number of technologies on campus. We've spent, I, I, we, we probably have uh, just about $3 million worth of, of, of wind technology on our campus. Um, you know, I've, I've been involved in, in, in all of those, those, um, those the, the feasibility studies to determine what types of technologies and you know, how, how we can maximize those utilities in particular, uh, particular locations. Um, we have a lot of renewable on campus. We do a lot of research. We study it a lot. Um, but we also engage with others to, to, to demonstrate, you know, what is the best type of technology, uh, how, you know, what benefits can you bring to the table if you inject a, a, a certain type of technology in the community or in, in a particular context. So we, we, we've got a, um, UNT has a, a very uh, comprehensive understanding and 
and focus on renewable energy and, and its utility. I, and, and wind is probably um, more prominent in that regard. Uh, not that solar is uh, to be discounted, uh, but wind, generally speaking, is, is, much more, is much more efficient. And so, so I, I, I know that the recommendations that you were sharing a minute ago are preliminary at this point, but that first one that you had on the list about the holistic um, uh, renewable energy. A strategy. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. Um, the holistic coordinated renewable energy plan. Do you see that that questions about how wind fits in? Is that part of that oh, idea? Oh, absolutely. How does that work um, exactly? So, the, you know, most cities nowadays are looking at the renewable energy idea um, or issue, and and uh, even for us at UNT, um, we're developing a strategy so that we can look at the full context of the installation of renewable energy. Uh, the different, many different types of technology that would best fit, you know, not just the, the grander context, but the, the micro level context, if you will, and how many benefits that we can pull from each each installation. Um, and so, for for a city, um, especially a city of this size, um, the, the best approach is, is is going to be to try to to understand or define a vision. Really, what is the city? What does it want to to accomplish? What are its objectives when it comes to Installing or uh, injecting renewable energy into the city. What is it? What are the objectives specifically for the city proper, the municipality? What are the objectives for the residents? What are the what would the objectives be for any other stakeholders, especially to include the ISD? Um, because there, renewable energy can be used for more than just uh, reducing costs uh, or reducing emissions. Um, it can be used to enhance your culture, to let folks, uh, to increase awareness and, and understanding of, of what sustainability practices or activities or innovations mean holistically on, on, their, on their, 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 their livelihoods. Um, and it can also be used to, uh, in the recycling program as well, can also be used to enhance the educational experience of our young people. And, and now with HB5, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with House Bill 5, uh, students have to make a choice. And a lot of them are going to be choosing STEM-related activities, uh, educational experiences, and to be able to experience renewable energy and all the many different types of those technologies in a, in a community as they're growing up, um, will we'll, we'll put them at another level once they go post-secondary, uh, whether it you know, into a vocation or a career. And I think it's exactly right. And the way you're going to achieve this is through early education yeah. and the younger generation. And just think about it. If you put a site down there at Leland, now you've got five new school districts that you're inviting into your city on a regular basis. And not only are you inviting them in, but now they become more affiliated, more associated with North Texas. Right. As they get older, they're probably, they're more leaning towards continuing their education at North Texas instead of going to Alter Slide. Well, even, even more broadly speaking, the entire city of Louisville with a, with a holistic strategy, it becomes a focal point right. for other cities, other school districts, <coughs> other states, and, you know, and really internationally. Uh, because there are so many applications or potential applications for renewable energy Within the city, I mean, across the dam, you know, around Lila, on um, rooftops, and at residences, etc. Um, it, but it, 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 this is something that it really needs to be thought out um, because it, this is a, renew a renewable energy application at this level. It's a very complex um, uh, challenge, and um, and it can be very, very expensive. And you, 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 I would recommend that it would be very thought out because you want to make a, a, a strong investment. Um, Particularly at nowadays, there's there are a lot of different funding models out there, where you can partner with a manufacturer, a manufacturer of a technology, uh, a renewable energy technology, and or a wholesaler of renewable energy technologies, uh, where you don't actually have to purchase the technology. They will bring it in, and, and you have to, generally speaking, and you you have to uh, seek out a megawatt of uh, which is a you know, thousand kW, a kW, uh, a megawatt of energy production. Um, and so, uh, but they will install that technology and then you lease that technology from them monthly. And so this could save the, the city literally millions, tens of millions of dollars depending on the, the, the size of the uh, generation amount. And just to let you know, when I'm saying bring a facility down here, I'm not saying you gotta go spend $100 million and bring the building a big facility. 
we just saw a little video last night, maybe you could get Karen to share, share it with you. It was about Ted. It's not about this stuff down that comes alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's another deal. And you could start with something that's very inexpensive. Start with something, and, and, and I'm, I know your chancellor and your president is going to be very concerned about results. And they're going to be results oriented. And they want to know, okay, you show me how I can make it. You start off with something small. You do it at a very small scale, but you do it in a way that does give it traction. If it starts producing, you're like, yeah, this is working. So now we increase and now we build it up. And then you become that focal point. But I, I mean, you look at the school districts you're going to touch that would be visiting that place on a monthly basis. And how many kids' lives are you touching that eventually are going to attend North Texas? Maybe this. Right. I mean, even. And obviously, I'm a big picture guy, so even more broadly, it would, when I read Louisville 2025 and the vision, the aspect of the vision in terms of engaging the international community, right. so you take that to a whole, a whole different level. Uh, and so, yeah, and the universe, there's benefits there for the university, for, for the city, and, and for the local partners. I've got a question, so, and I realize it's drilling out a little deeper, maybe, but I'm just curious. Are you aware of any um, cities that are doing public-private partnerships with uh, uh, commercial buildings involving, uh, in particular, wind generators that are placed across the roof line? Sure. Uh, I, 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 yes, there, there, are, there are a bunch around the country. I mean, you're going to see a lot of that in terms of solar out in Arizona, uh, wind, <clears throat> some of the solar up in Oregon, Washington State. You're going to see a lot of using wind technologies. Um, when we bring the final report back, um, uh, in, in May, we are going to bring you some very specific best practices to address these types of questions. And so what we will look at are, um, we'll bring you best practices in terms of different types of technologies and their applications, uh, and as it relates to the different types of benefits that can be incurred if, if those types of partnerships or relationships or situations are, are brought about in most of them. So we'll, we'll bring you some, some nice specificity. And are there, are there further questions for Todd? Because I know we want to get your direction on the overall sustainability, but before we do that, I want to make sure Cleve has a chance to cover these things to you. Todd, you, you'd be able to stay a little bit. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I guess sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've got three real quick. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, sorry. And I don't know if it meets your span of control or if it's just for staff, but um, to piggyback on wind, I'm, I'm very interested in vertical access wind turbines mm -hmm. and, and how efficient they might be for specific residential wind. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you guys know about the <coughs> PACE working here in the state of Texas? So the, those PACE programs that some states have put together, which is property assessed clean energy. Um, and I don't know what you know of that or where it's hung up in the state of Texas or if we can figure that out because I think that's one great sure. way to uh, alternative finance. Of course, that may be on a more residential scale, but I've been seeing it at the scale of city. Um, and then um, Plano Solar has a really interesting program that's resident driven. And, and how might we create that type of scope for our residents? So that's, those are my, my thoughts as we look at sustainability and green power and those different alternatives is, yes, I know you're, you're tasked with the municipality for, as an entity, but I'm thinking <coughs> that more broadly as the municipality as the residents as well. Right, and, and we and we think that way as well. And, and uh, so when we come back with those those best practices, those recommendations, um, you'll see a hint of the reference to or the linkage to the residential piece because uh, because we do really need to think about those things. Um, generally speaking, vertical is, is more efficient. Good to know. Yeah. And Councilman, uh, the clock reached out to us around about two months ago <coughs> and asked how many cities might be interested in learning more about the PACE program. There were five cities that responded. They how many were actually there? Yeah. Oh, there were um, several. Several. A lot. Uh, some of them were smaller. Small things like Lancaster. You yeah. know. And we did attend the session. Okay. And uh, I think we found it may have some problems for us. Mm -hmm. We're still pursuing that. So uh, we will be putting together some uh, recommendations on the case. We are gathering information. Thank you. Yes, sir. So you might want to go to the Yes. Okay. Okay, well, to, to Member Mayor, um, I think we're going to give Todd a spot on the the, uh, the Nest team, and then that way they'll be at City Hall every Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to run through this quickly uh, in regards to SmartScape. SmartScape 
we were calling it Zero Escape. We were talking about different types of things, and we decided that, that there is an initiative with uh, North Central Texas Regional Council of Governments <coughs> called SmartScape, and they do a lot of other things, including stormwater runoff and all that in their initiative. But it's basically the same thing that we're after in regards to, to landscaping practices. So single-family residential proposed, uh, what we're looking at is currently you can, uh, it's not really SmartScape, but it maybe saves you money uh, as far as water, but you currently, there's nothing in our ordinance that can stop somebody from completely barking the front of their property or filling it in with gravel they, as long as they have their one tree. Um, so what we're after is, is coming up with uh, comprehensive design, water conservation measures, indigenous plants, and not only indigenous plants, but also adaptive plants, and then having smaller percentages of uh, areas that need water, uh, specifically into your turf areas. Same with commercial. Uh, the only thing that's really different in the commercial side of it is that we may want to adjust our ordinance for uh, planting times, because a lot of times contractors and people want to get their certificate of occupancy, but they just can't plant the plants that's required for them to get their CO. So we're going to be making those adjustments. Um, how do we make it work? Obviously, we change the landscape ordinance. But we are currently working on that in the nest team environment, uh, primarily with our sustainability manager, Lisa, uh, doing the majority of the work. Uh, we're hoping to have a workshop to you soon, and then hopefully adoption by the end of this year, early uh, 2016. We're also looking at incentive programs. There's a number of them out there. That we yesterday, we were researching them all. Uh, also partnering with civic groups on, on the program allocation, pre-post qualifiers, uh, and then also hosting mandatory educational uh, incentives. Um, and then obviously we want to engage the stakeholders because it does affect the retailers, builders, and developers, and, and so we want to make sure, and along with the uh, designers and keep Lewis built beautiful, make sure we're all on the same page. Moving quickly to the green codes, uh, good news. 2018 International Green Code, I know it's three years out, they're going to start this year, the process of developing this particular edition of the code. Yeah, every three years we go through a cycle, 2012, or 2012 was the first one, um, and it's still under review, it's been stalled in review, I'll explain that real quickly, and then 2015 is going to be finalized, uh, and I'll cover that on the next slides this year, and we'll be bringing part of that to you. 2018, what's significant about that is, all the players that have a stake in green codes, specifically the last one, United States Green Build Council, those are the lead folks. You hear the lead certification? Those are the lead folks. The Eliminating Engineer Society, that they help address the issues that Councilman Ferguson has in regards to light pollution. The main players in this document are the heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning engineers. Um, they're going to begin those efforts to create one document that everybody works off of rather than having your lead out here and your other, you know, your residential green and all these other. So that's that's a really awesome thing as far as I'm concerned. And the staff has put in a request to be a part of the, the research and development of that over the next three years. Um, International Green Construction Code, what's nice about that is it's adoptable, it's mandatory, and it's enforceable. The majority of your green codes out there, if they're not adopted or even portions are adopted, they're still voluntary. And so this is this is a little more intense, but it has the it has the right intent behind it, and that's to reduce the negative impacts on the environment and the natural environment. Um, it addresses everything from from the ground to the building to the indoor environment to the outdoor environment, and it's it's a minimal code, so we can customize it the way we want. And also with COGS recommendations, if they ever get there, we'll have that as well. Um, and then also, again, it deals with everything inside the building, and there's also provisions for existing buildings. So the time frame for the implementation, currently 2012 is suspended because COG said we've got a whole new set of building codes, the 2015 codes, building pl plumbing, mechanical, electrical, we've got to look at all of those, so let's suspend the 2012 because there was some conflict with 2012 in regards to industry trying to catch up with the standard. So 2015's mended all of those. And so we're looking at that's going to be finalized in April in Memphis, Tennessee. We should have it available in May. Hog review with all the 2015 codes throughout this year. And we hope to come to council with a package for all the 2015 codes, including the green code, in the beginning of next year, 2016. That's it. Hold those. So questions for please. 
I got one quick. I'll know those classes you're referring to again. <clears throat> Are you looking at doing that for people that have been unlucky thinking about the electrical heating there and everything? As they have to replace a system mandating that they go through that, or would just be for new construction? Right now, those mandates lie with the state. The state's increasing, they raise the bar. They're now making everybody in the state use the 2012 energy code, and probably they'll jump it up to the 2015 once that's finalized. So what we're seeing right now is that the replacements, they're, they're good, they're beneficial to the environment, but people are, it's state law, and state's kind of taken the lead, so to speak, L-E-A-D, uh, in regards to making that happen. So it will, unfortunately, that does have an impact. Other questions for Clue? I'm not sure if anybody understood what the current regulation from the state is as far as uh, replacement. So it's under the 2012 code, and it depends, basically it depends on the size of your building, but there's a minimum SEER, if you will, is what they call it, rating right. of your heating and air conditioning unit, and I think that's 16 SEER at this point. That's the minimum. So a lot of houses have 12 and 13. Mine had 13. I had to replace it. I had to go to larger size. But it's a more efficient size. Okay. And you're not required to do it until you have a. Until you, until you have to replace it. Right. I, the only other thing I'd add is that I do think it's imperative that we authorize that to be a part of that group that you were referring to that y'all applied to do. I think we ought to make sure that the staff able to participate in that. Okay. So, so you've heard about a, a number of particular things on sustainability, and each of those have had some recommendations involved with them. What we're looking to get direction from you, uh, as you've already started on Mayor, is uh, the, the sense of your priorities on uh, which actions, which of these aspects of sustainability are the most important ones to move forward on, which ones do you want to see uh, things coming back to you this year. Um, and so to recap that, um, with what, uh, what you heard from UNT, they will be coming back to you with a report in May. Um, and at that time, I'm sure that they will have refined those preliminary recommendations. Uh, but that recommendation of creating a holistic, coordinated, renewable energy plan uh, is, is one that they're looking, so far that looks to be part of, uh, part of that priority. Is that something that you all as a council think is, you, you want to move forward on this year? Is that a priority for you all? If I were to pick a priority that would be higher than that, okay. it would be, if we're going to make any of these kinds of changes that are going to impact commercial properties, I'd want those in place as soon as possible because of the I-35 expansion. Because we have so much change up in the air on that. I want to make sure that those... those so from the standpoint, another from the, from the standpoint of regulations for the design and the yeah, construction Yes, if there are any changes okay. in, in, in design build standards, um, any okay. benefits that we might give if <coughs> we go for lead, uh, whatever, whatever might impact that corridor and, and give us the best possible product. But by the same token, I, I don't want to move the target for developers. Okay, okay. Is that a, a consensus? What I'm hearing from you, TJ, and uh, Eric is going to keep track of our, our direction up here. Uh, is um, He's doing a good job so far. <laughs> 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 is that number one? <laughs> one, one, one Okay, so, so, so what, what, I, what I hear you saying as a priority for this year is um, determine impacts on commercial building standards so that they can be put in place now related to 35. Related to any rebuilds. Any rebuilds, any yeah. new yeah. construction or rebuilds yeah. along yeah. 35. New construction. Understand, understand and get that in place now that that would be that right? i mean the, the only and the only reason i put that as for me the number one not that there's mr ferguson's comment was absolutely i'm behind on that but okay. to my mind there's a time constraint okay. on 35. Sure. Right. okay great okay so uh the building codes and standards uh in place for commercial um yeah okay <laughs> okay um the the holistic energy uh renewable energy plan other action on the, the recommendations from UNT? Are you all comfortable with the direction you've heard so far on that? Wanting to move forward with that? Okay. I'd um, like to see us work with UNT on trying to get some type of a, a facility down here, maybe out of lead or something. <laughs> and I'm serious about it. It could be something as, you know, you, you saw that movie yesterday. It could be something as small as maybe they come out there and you put a pin up and you have some classes, you have professors come down and do some stuff. And you'd like the school district in, we could work with you, make sure if you need transportation, make sure that PCTA help us in providing transportation. 
and work with the community and then see how people respond to it. And see, you start getting the results and you start having the people flock to it and you're like overwhelmed how many people show up. You know, wow, this thing is really, it could really be an asset to it. Okay, so maybe uh, would, would like that for that ex explore some kind of a pilot center with UNT? Correct. Um, on the, the landscaping, uh, Cliff described to you the landscaping ordinances to come back to you later on this year, um, as well as incentives and efforts to engage the stakeholders. Are you all comfortable with those directions? Is there anything else that you want to uh, suggest on those topics? Yeah, well, go ahead. Well, one possibility, it doesn't directly deal with landscaping, but you keep, uh, we keep hearing incentives. Mm -hmm. And as far as that is concerned, I mean, maybe the city or in combination with somebody else can offer some type of incentive uh, for like uh, appliance repl replacement, mm -hmm. you know, uh, washers sure. and, and Yeah, there, and are, water there are other cities that have programs like And when, uh, you know, a citizen comes in to buy one, if they upgrade to whatever level we determine, Maybe the city could help pay a portion of that or give them some kind of break in some kind okay. of way. So, Clay, as a comment. Well, we are looking at that. <coughs> One of the things that we've made a priority is water conservation, and we've looked at landscaping, but then also secondary to that would be interior fixtures. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa had, had a program put together. We talked about it last night. We're going to resurrect that program where there's some kind of incentive for people to, if they come in and they buy a toilet and it's a you know, low water usage or, or a, a fixture of some kind, or and possibly even a washer, washing machine, that kind of thing, then there would be some incentive package for that or a reimbursement of some type. Does that include uh, tankless hot water heaters? Yes. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, okay. So I started to see something like it. I, I was really impressed with something you brought up, which is the uh, the problem that it's a perennial problem, not just from a uh, you know smartscape point of view, but a landscape that has to be in by a certain time in order to get a CEO and trying to come up with a plan where we can make that a more. Um, That's good. Already did it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the last item that uh, that Cleve shared with you on the green code, uh, Mayor, you had made the comment that you wanted to be sure staff has the direction to participate fully right. in. Uh, in those upgrades and in that, that community. We're going to so, go down this path. you got to know what you're doing, and you got to okay. have to be there with that person or doing okay. okay. And then I, I, are you all comfortable with, uh, as Cleve shared with you, the, the use of that one unified green code uh, as that comes in, as that gets in? Okay. Any other uh, issues or direction at this point regarding the sustainability movement? Okay. So we're, we're, we're uh, Capturing all of that, and uh, and so I think our next item is for lunch. Yep. Uh, lunch. Donna, it's lunch, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the seven point, the seven point, uh, point, and new design uh, that we've done in partnership with uh, BCPA and Compass. One one fifteen. Okay. Fifteen. So one forty five. One fifteen. Okay. We're